time to come death, the destroyer of worlds. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. On August 7, 1945, the day after Hiroshima was destroyed, Dr. Yoshio Nishina, a leading Japanese physicist and other atomic scientists, arrived in Hiroshima to examine the damage. They confirmed that the city had been destroyed by an atomic bomb and reported back to the cabinet in Tokyo. Despite this, the cabinet decided to continue the war, a decision intercepted by American magic code breakers. Meanwhile, President Truman returned from the Potsdam Conference and spoke about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima, describing it as a military base. He later declared, we shall continue to use it until we completely destroy Japan's power to make war. With no sign of Japan surrendering, the decision was made to attack another city. On August 9, 1945, at 3.47 a.m., the B-29 Superfortress Boxcar commanded by Major Charles Sweeney, took off from Tinian Island with the Fat Man plutonium bomb on board. The mission plan was almost identical to that of Hiroshima, with two B-29s, including the Enola Gay, flying an hour ahead as weather scouts. Boxcar was accompanied by two observation aircraft, the Great Artiste and Big Stink. The primary target was Kakura, known for its arsenal and military equipment production, with Nagasaki as the secondary target. Sweeney took off with the bomb already armed, but with the electrical safety plugs still engaged. During the pre-flight inspection, the flight engineer told Sweeney that the aircraft had a malfunctioning fuel pump. Replacing the pump would take hours. And worse still, moving the fat man to another aircraft might take just as long and was dangerous as well as the bomb was live. Therefore, Tibbets and Sweeney decided to continue the mission with Boxcar. Observers aboard the weather planes reported both targets, Kokura and Nagasaki, as clear. When Boxcar arrived at the rendezvous point over Yakushima Island, the great artiste joined shortly after. However, the big stink failed to make the rendezvous because it was flying much higher than it should have been and was not flying tight circles over Yakushima as agreed. Although Boxcar was ordered not to circle longer than 15 minutes, it waited for Big Stink for 40 minutes before leaving the rendezvous point. As commander of the aircraft, Sweeney decided to proceed to the primary target, Kokura. The delay at the rendezvous caused clouds and drifting smoke from fires started by a major firebombing raid on nearby Yahata the previous day to obscure Kokura. Additionally, the Yahata steelworks intentionally burned coal tar to produce black smoke. The resulting conditions covered 70% of the area over Kokura, obscuring the aiming point. Over the next 50 minutes, three bomb runs were made, burning fuel and exposing the aircraft to heavy defenses, but the bombardier could not drop visually. By the third bomb run, Japanese anti-aircraft fire was getting close. With fuel running low due to the failed fuel pump, Boxcar and the Great Artiste headed for their secondary target, Nagasaki. The term Kokura's luck emerged from this mission, highlighting how the city's obscured visibility due to weather and smoke spared it from the atomic bomb. The crew decided that if Nagasaki was obscured on arrival, they would carry the bomb to Okinawa and dispose of it in the ocean if necessary. At about 7.50 a.m. Japanese time, an air raid alert was sounded in Nagasaki, but the all-clear signal was given at 8.30 when only two B-29 superfortresses were sighted at 10.53 a.m. The Japanese assumed the planes were only on reconnaissance and no further alarm was given. A few minutes later, at 11 a.m. Japanese time, the Great Artiste dropped instruments attached to three parachutes. These instruments also contained an unsigned letter to Professor Sagane, a physicist at the University of Tokyo, who had studied with three of the scientists responsible for the atomic bomb at the University of California, Berkeley. The letter urged him to tell the public about the dangers of these weapons of mass destruction. At 11.01 a.m., as Boxcar approached Nagasaki, a lucky break in the clouds allowed the bombardier to visually sight the target as ordered. The Fat Man bomb, containing approximately five kilograms or 11 pounds of plutonium, was released over the city's industrial valley. 
It detonated 47 seconds later, at 11.02 a.m., approximately 503 meters or 1,650 feet above the ground. The explosion occurred almost directly over a tennis court, halfway between two significant industrial targets. The Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works in the south and the Nagasaki Arsenal in the north. This location was nearly three kilometers or 1.9 miles northwest of the planned hypocenter. The blast released energy equivalent to 21 kilotons of TNT. Due to the geographical layout of Nagasaki, with the Urakami Valley acting as a natural barrier, a major portion of the city was shielded from the full force of the explosion by the surrounding hills. Nonetheless, the devastation within the blast radius was immense. The initial fireball created by the explosion reached temperatures of several million degrees Celsius, instantly incinerating everything within a one-mile radius. The resulting shockwave and intense heat caused widespread fires and destruction, leveling buildings and infrastructure. The blast also produced lethal radiation, contributing to both immediate and long-term casualties. Boxcar and its support aircraft, the Great Artiste, quickly left the area after the bomb release. Meanwhile, Big Stink, which had been separated earlier, spotted the explosion from a distance of 160 kilometers or 100 miles away and flew over to observe the aftermath. The immediate death toll was estimated to be between 40,000 and 75,000 people, with tens of thousands more succumbing to injuries and radiation effects in the following months and years. After the Hiroshima bombing, it is estimated that as many as 200 people sought refuge in Nagasaki, only to endure another atomic explosion. These individuals were known as double survivors. Nine of them claimed to be in the blast zone in both cities. Tsutomu Yamaguchi was the first officially recognized survivor of both bombings. He was confirmed to be three kilometers or 1.9 miles from ground zero in Hiroshima on a business trip when the bomb detonated. He was seriously burnt on his left side and spent the night in Hiroshima. He arrived in his home city of Nagasaki on August 8th, the day before the bombing, and was exposed to residual radiation while searching for his relatives. Yamaguchi died in 2010 of stomach cancer. Only hours before Boxcar took off from Tinian, Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov had informed Tokyo of the Soviet Union's unilateral abrogation of the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact. At two minutes past midnight on August 9th, Tokyo time, Soviet infantry, armor, and air forces had launched the Manchurian Strategic Offensive Operation. Four hours later, word reached Tokyo of the Soviet Union's official declaration of war, crushing the last hope of the Japanese government for Soviet mediation. But still, the senior leadership of the Japanese army began preparations to impose martial law on the nation with the support of Minister of War Anami to stop anyone attempting to make peace. This was only hours before Boxcar would release the Fat Man bomb. The Big Six formally met on the morning of August 9, 1945 to address the situation. The full cabinet met at 2.30 p.m. and spent most of the day debating surrender. Anami conceded that victory was unlikely but argued in favor of continuing the war. The discussion during this meeting centered on both the Hiroshima bombing and the Soviet invasion of Manchuria. They were interrupted by news of the atomic bombing of Nagasaki during their deliberations. The meeting ended at 5.30 p.m. with no decision having been reached. At the meeting, the Big Six were divided. For accepting the Potsdam Declaration were Prime Minister Suzuki, Foreign Minister Togo, and Admiral Yonai. For continuing the war with conditions were Minister of War Anami, General Umezu, and Admiral Toyoda. They insisted on conditions including no occupation of Japan and conducting their own war crimes trials. With the Big Six deadlocked, Prime Minister Suzuki went to the palace to seek the intervention of Emperor Hirohito. An imperial conference was convened late on August 9th into the early hours of August 10th. This was a significant and unprecedented step 
as the emperor traditionally did not intervene directly in political decisions. During the conference, the arguments from both sides were presented. Ultimately, Emperor Hirohito expressed his desire to end the war, stating that Japan must bear the unbearable to prevent further destruction and suffering. He favored accepting the Potsdam Declaration with the sole condition of preserving Kokutai, the imperial institution. On August 14th, Hirohito recorded his capitulation announcement. On that day, Anami signed the surrender document with the rest of the cabinet and committed seppuku early the next morning. His suicide note read, I, with my death, humbly apologize, meaning to the emperor, for the great crime. Japan officially surrendered to the Allies on August 15, 1945. The formal signing of the surrender documents took place on September 2, 1945, aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay. In 1959, General Tibbets, who piloted the Enola Gay that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, met with Captain Fuchida, the Japanese officer, who led the first wave of the attack on Pearl Harbor. In a conversation, Tibbets said to Fuchida, You sure did surprise us at Pearl Harbor in which he replied, what do you think you did to us at Hiroshima? Fuchida further told him, you did the right thing. You know the Japanese attitude at that time, how fanatic they were, they die for the emperor. Every man, woman and child would have resisted that invasion with sticks and stones if necessary. Can you imagine what a slaughter it would be to invade Japan? It would have been terrible. The Japanese people know more about that than the American public will ever know. Hiro Onoda, a Japanese soldier, is renowned for his incredible story of loyalty and survival, having refused to surrender for nearly 30 years after World War II ended. Onoda was an intelligence officer in the Imperial Japanese Army, stationed on Lubang Island in the Philippines. When the war ended in August 1945, Onoda and his small group of soldiers were unaware or refused to believe it. They initially encountered a leaflet in October 1945 announcing Japan's surrender, but they dismissed it as Allied propaganda. The turning point came only in 1974, when the Japanese government located Onoda's former commanding officer, Major Taniguchi, who traveled to Lubang to formally relieve Onoda of his duties. On March 9, 1974, Taniguchi personally delivered the orders to Onoda, convincing him that the war had indeed ended. Many argue that World War II has not yet ended because Japan and the Soviet Union, now Russia, have not signed a formal peace treaty due to the disagreement over the sovereignty of the Kuril Islands, an unresolved conflict that keeps a shadow from the past hanging over the present day. <laughs>